Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline. Today, joined by Dr. Megan Ranney, attending physician, Department of Emergency Medicine, Rhode Island Hospital, Providence, Rhode Island, also assistant professor, Alpert uh, Medical School, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and also director of Brown Emergency Digital Health Innovation Program. So uh, plenty of stuff to keep you busy, a lot of stuff going on there. And so what we wanted to talk about today, the main topic is um, you focus on um, here at ASAP 15, you have a talk on super users. It's a huge issue that many of us are dealing with around the country. You know, dealing with those, we're getting a lot of pressures from outside sources, whether it's administration or state or federal, to decrease the misuse of the emergency room. And honestly, it's it's not a simple issue. It's not as simple as, as just saying, you don't need to come in here for whatever you're in here, just stay away. There's really some more issues here. So give us some background of what got you into the super user discussion and give us some of the background on our issues, our problems that we're facing. Absolutely, thank you so much. So Ryan, thanks for having me here. I'm glad to be here and thrilled to be speaking at ASAP. Um, so what got me into the super users discussion? Well, when you look at kind of who comes back to the emergency department, right? So about 30% of our visits are injuries. And if you look at who comes back over and over, somewhere around 20 to 40% of them are people with chronic behavioral health issues, mm -hmm. substance use, alcohol use, opioid dependence, history of violence, either partner or community violence, that those are the people that come back. And they're the folks that are most frustrating for us to treat, right? They cause high rates of burnout. They cost a lot, and they're the folks that you walk in the room and you kind of throw up your hands, right? Like you love the easy chest pain, but when you walk in the room and someone's a chronic alcoholic and they got in a fight again, and right, you watch your residents or yourself kind of start to tune them out a little. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to look into, well, what is it that we can do to, to help these folks? Um, I was very lucky to get to do uh, my training at Brown and a fellowship there um, where we have a number of great public health researchers and there's some really great and really well validated techniques that you can use with these patients both on a one-on-one -on -one level so on your everyday shift in the midst of seeing your 2.5 or 3 patients per hour um, and then some stuff that you can do more on the community or on the hospital level to help address uh, these frequent flyers or frequent users and to address really like you said those underlying issues that are bringing them back most of them aren't in the ED because they want to be there they may be looking for a fix but most of them are there because there's some other kind of underlying thing and so if you can address what that underlying issue is you can then decrease the the utilization and it's clear that what we're one of the big issues is there's not just one thing it's not people who don't have access just don't have access it's not just people who are looking for convenience it's not just alcoholics and not just drug abusers it's it's very complex of an issue so uh, how do you if if you're in one of those states or one of those facilities right now starting to get into dealing with a super issue super user issue how do you start to look at this how do you start to address the issue in any way mm -hmm. that's a great question and that is a great observation right and so we know that it's actually not at all for most of these patients an issue of access mm -hmm. right so the vast majority of patients that come to the emergency department are insured and have a primary care physician they may come because we're more easily accessible but it's not because they can't get care elsewhere right so there's the issues there's a few issues and it really depends on which kind of super user you're talking about but one of the first things is looking at your patient panel and so looking at your particular hospital and identifying who your very very top utilizers are who are the people that are coming in 10 times a month or 20 times a month so that's one way to deal with it is to start with those and start creating case management plans that are particular to them and uh, Washington State did a really nice job with this with with opioid users with kind of creating care plans identifying their most frequent users and then what they did is it's not just that you say oh I'm sorry you're a frequent user you're not allowed to come into the ED anymore but you have to provide them with an alternative right so you have to provide them so say you're working on specifically the opioid issue you have to find a way to link them into referrals to get them into addiction care and rehab because otherwise they're gonna they may not come to your ED they're gonna go to somebody else's right and it doesn't actually solve the problem um, for other people they'll say well let me look at what I can do on a day-to-day -day shift and so there it becomes you go into the rooms of people and you kind of in, in an ideal world you ask everybody questions but it may be that you say well these people that are particularly high risk that I see here a lot I'm gonna ask them the questions about how much do you drink in a week uh, have you been a victim of you know are you safe in your relationship have you been a victim of violence tell me about your use of opioids how's that going for you and then being able to have a brief conversation with them to motivate them to look at their issue 
and to identify it as linked to their ED visit. And then the most important part becomes having resources to refer them to. So you can do it on a hospital level, but you can also do it on an individual level. And this was one of the big things in our talk is I think a lot of people feel like they're blocked, right? Mm -hmm. Because they go, I'm just, you know, I'm a staff emergency physician working in a community ED. My hospital administration could care less. Um, but you can still do stuff on an individual level. You can create your list of community organizations. You can find out the 1-800 numbers that you can call to link the domestic violence victims to so that they can start getting help. And those things can really shift the needle um, in a way that actually has a much lower number needed to treat than a lot of the stuff that we do every day. And, uh, and you know, it brings, brings to bear one of the largest issues here. It's you know, getting down to whatever numbers you decide to look at, identifying the main causes or needs, mm -hmm. and then it's unlike, you know, where if I tell you I, I need you to um, go to this meeting every Monday, you take care of that, you do that. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like in a lot of these cases, it's more of a, uh, especially with social work or, mm -hmm. or case management, more involved um, in actually helping arrange things, doing things, being more active. And it's, is that one of the bigger roles we're seeing here that needs to be brought into your hospital or your facility is that active management of a patient? That's huge, absolutely. So, you know, one thing, right, so when you're on a shift and you've got 40 patients out in the waiting room, which maybe at my level one trauma center is, is an occurrence more often than we'd like, um, but, but I am not gonna be able to spend an hour and a half with a patient you know, going through kind of their traumatic incidents in their life and linking them up with services and dealing with their tears and, and then following them up and making sure they actually got to the appointment. And so that is where having a good relationship with case management or social work is so key because A, it's financially feasible, right? So they, you can afford to pay them for that. They can then go in and have the time. You don't feel rushed. And it allows you to feel safe in identifying those patients because you know that you're not gonna just lose control of your department during the time that you're dealing with those issues. And I think that that's what keeps a lot of us from even wanting to tackle the issue is that we're afraid of how much time it's gonna take and whether or not we have the expertise by having a case manager or a social worker. It frees us from that responsibility. It allows us to do what we do best, which is to, tri you know, to triage, identify the problem, and then link people into the right resources. But your point is also good in terms of the post-discharge process, and that is not something that we should be having to do as emergency physicians, but that case management or social work programs can do. And I'm actually seeing increasing number of hospitals do some really interesting stuff with technology to link patients in. So you can use text messaging, for instance, to very effectively get low-income patients to follow up with their post-discharge appointments. You can use apps um, to engage alcoholics in treatment programs and, and things like that. So there are some neat ways to engage those patients um, that may use even less people time than, than having a dedicated case manager or social worker. Um, but really, I mean, it comes down to, you're right, for a lot of these people, you have to address the social stuff that goes around the reasons why they showed up in the first place. Well, it's a lot more hand-holding than, yeah. you'd than think. we are was, used to yeah, doing. Yeah, than we're used to doing. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, you, got, you touched on some of the technology that's out there, maybe the apps, mm -hmm. um, phone calls, those sorts of mm -hmm. things. What, it, what are the roles of you know, trying to keep folks from coming in, mainly getting them to where they need to be? What are the roles of things such as community paramedicine, home health, and mm -hmm. uh, folks like that? Great. So I was actually, just before I came here, I was talking with someone who started up a really interesting program with having uh, emergency physicians on call to communities, to, to community locations to try to minimize frequent visits by, by some kind of patients with multiple chronic conditions. Um, and I think that we're seeing an increasing number of those programs. So for instance, down in Texas, there's some, some great work with community paramedicine and the mentally ill mm -hmm. in terms of taking those crisis, patient, those crisis stabilization patients where there's no medical need and moving them into a more appropriate setting as opposed to clogging up an ED bed for 48 hours or however long it takes to get placement. Um, there's also some good work around sobriety centers, right, about taking in the chronic alcoholics and giving them a safe place to stay instead of having them come into the ED. Um, and so there's, I think that one of our roles as emergency physicians is to define how do we manage that? Because we know this patient population better than anyone else in the healthcare system. And so can you work, and, and it's going to be an individual, for now at least, locale by locale, you're going to know your own regional politics and resources and for you is it working with paramedics is it working with social workers is it identifying a community agency for the homeless that you can work with that will serve as that resource but it is finding those alternative sources of care 
So um, if somebody has wants more information, we're just we're just scratching the surface right now. I mean, you, you, <laughs> the, you're, hours, the talk the is short, and this is even shorter. So how can people get more information? Contact you or whatnot? Where's some good information? That's a great question. So uh, there are a lot of great sources of information out there, and I think it depends on a few different things. So first of all, people are always welcome to contact me. Um, do you, will you post emails or yeah? So it's Megan underscore Ranny at Brown Edu happy to talk to people and happy to link people to whatever sources are best for you. Um, there are also some great resources online. So Jesse Pines Urgent Matters um, has terrific resources around kind of utilization and crowding and how to deal with things like this. I will be on ASAP News has also published some nice stuff around community paramedicine. Um, the, and then a number of the ASAP chapters. So Washington ASAP in particular has done a stellar job of piloting programs around this. Well, and I know uh, Washington State also, um, having Steve Anderson visit yeah. my state, um, is more than happy to send information, okay. send the seven best practices um, and those sorts of things to help you out. So there's a lot of information out there. It's a big issue to tackle. It's amazing how much money you can save, how much better it is for the patients, for the providers, safer for the providers mm -hmm. and for the hospitals and also frees up hospital beds because um, we all know uh, the volume is continuing to go up <laughs> and um, the hospitals don't seem to be getting much bigger. So um, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Rainey. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. All right. This is Dr. Ryan Stanton. You contact me at ryanstantonmd at gmail.com ryanstantonmd at gmail.com until next time thank you for joining this has been some asap frontline